Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of Cross Chain Examination. I'm your host, Catherine Wu. Each week on Cross Chain Examination, we have on the smartest and most interesting people working full time in the crypto industry to tell us what is top of mind for them. This week, we will be examining the intersection of crypto and public goods. But before we dive into the discussion, I wanted to give a quick overview of public goods in the traditional sense. So in economic theory, a public good, in contrast to a private good, is one that is non-excludable. So that means no one can exclude, can be excluded from the goods consumption and is non-rivalrous. So the goods consumption does not reduce its availability to others. So some examples of a public good in our traditional world or like in our current world is um, expecting the rule of law, or even more basic goods such as access to clean water, um, clean air, and drinking water. Today, um, blockchain-based networks are increasingly involved in a conversation surrounding the, uh, the development of public goods, and many in the crypto space are thinking hard about this topic. So with us today to discuss all things public goods and Gitcoin is Annika Lewis, who leads grants programs at Gitcoin. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, um, I'm really excited to talk about this because I just feel like it's been so front and center. And so I wanted to kick off this show by just diving into public goods. And what I mean about that is, you know, I feel like the funding public goods narrative have been on so many people's radar, especially right now in the crypto industry. Can you help us explain or understand why crypto is such a compelling fit for public goods? And can you also give some examples of what public goods mean in the crypto context? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's a really good framing. And I think as I think about public goods in a crypto context, kind of from a macro level, you know, a lot of why I'm excited about Web3 and why so many of us are excited about Web3 is the ability to kind of rethink and rebuild structures in society, in companies and in money, um, just from first principles, um, because, you know, we've got all of these new technologies and networks that can enable that. And I think public goods are kind of one such domain that a lot of people are starting to think through in a Web3 context about how might we fund public goods differently than how we do in Web2. I think the initial sort of compelling event for thinking about public goods in Web3 um, has been sort of the open source movement. And obviously open source has been around in Web2 for a long time. Um, but kind of the, the core thesis on which Gitcoin was founded, um, which obviously is an organization which I'm with that's very focused on public goods funding, was around digital public goods. And the fact that even in the Web2 world, open source software generates billions of dollars in economic value every year. And yet there aren't really intuitive funding mechanisms that exist for it. If you think about like traditional public goods, like you know, public parks or, you know, healthcare in many countries and, and all of, you know, what governments tend to fund through taxation, um, there isn't like an, an analogous sort of funding mechanism for digital public goods. Uh, and so that's kind of the thesis on which Gitcoin was built to think about open source software as a public good that should get funding um, in ways that perhaps are different from your traditional capital allocation mechanisms. I personally saw this problem firsthand. I used to be a VC investor focused on projects in analytics and data infrastructure. And I would always see these amazing open source founders trying to like shoehorn their open source projects into these business models that made sense to VCs. And so that's why I was so excited about Gitcoin and Web3 in the context of public goods and open source and kind of figuring out new ways to fund these projects that weren't necessarily, um, you know, in line with the existing structures. Yeah, it's actually an interesting paradox, um, which is that in crypto, I think so many protocols and the assumption of these protocols is that it's open source and everyone can, anyone can contribute. But the problem is that doesn't always necessarily means you can get compensated for your labor and time. And so I know there's a lot of core developers who's worked on crypto in the early days who just never really got paid for their work. Um, and so I've been seeing also the discussion of retroactive funding um, happen on my timeline. Um, which is interesting and it actually makes a lot of sense in my mind. So speaking of Gitcoin, um, so that's where you currently lead grants for, can you just give us a high level TLDR of what Gitcoin is and especially with the grants program, how does it work? Yeah, so Gitcoin is an organization focused on, on funding public goods and we have various mechanisms through which we do that. 
Uh, the primary mechanism and kind of our, our main product is our grants program, which you just mentioned. Um, I like to describe Gitcoin grants as a three-sided marketplace. Uh, so there's basically three constituents that are involved in the Gitcoin grants program. There are the matching funders, which are effectively like B2B kind of, you know, blue chip companies or DAOs within the Ethereum ecosystem very often who are having a desire to give back to the community and fund public goods. Um, and they will often donate kind of large sums of money to be distributed across these grantees. So matching funders are the first side. Then you have community donors like you and I who see value in funding these types of projects, whether it's it's maybe an open source protocol that we're building on top of. Um, it's another project we're passionate about for some reason. And so we decide to donate, you know, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars um, through effectively crowdfunding towards these projects. And then finally, you have the grantees. And so these are folks who are, you know, either open source developers or building another public good of some sort that post their project to the Gitcoin platform in hopes of receiving funding for that project. And so these three sides of the marketplace come together every three months when we run this quarterly grants program, which is a two week period in which all of those matching funds are distributed to the grantees on the platform. Um, so it's effectively kind of a combination of like crowdfunding as well as large donors. Uh, and it's all driven by the community and a mechanism that is called quadratic funding that, uh, that basically distributes those funds in a much more democratic way than a top down grants program would. So the idea is to fund early stage projects that are public goods that may not have other sources of funding and hopefully help get them off the ground and on their feet. Let's say for cross-chain examination, I've been, you know, work on educational content for folks who want to come in this space and maybe for next season, whatever, maybe I don't want my sponsors or whatever, even though I love them. Um, what would be the process? Do I like write a proposal? Does somebody approve them? Like, how do I actually go about getting funded? Yeah, great question. So the process is much less arduous than a typical grants application. You just go to gitcoin.co slash grants, and then you'll see a button to create a grant. You'll fill out a form that takes not more than 15 minutes um, and asks you a bunch of information about your project, what you're working on, um, you know, some verification stuff like your Twitter and your GitHub handle, and then it goes in for review. And the only review effectively that happens at the beginning is, is our fraud team is doing a bunch of checks to make sure that it's not a fake project or ha having kind of malicious intent or content um, and that it meets the definition of a public good. And then it's posted to the platform and then anyone can see your grant, can contribute to it, and you can benefit from the quadratic funding pools that are provided by those matching funders. And explain to me um, what quadratic funding actually is. Yeah, so quadratic funding, by way of background, is a mechanism that was developed by Vitalik Buterin, of course, the founder of Ethereum, uh, Glenn Weil, and Zoe Hitzig. And you can read, they've got a, a long paper on it, you can read the whole 30-page paper and learn about it, or you can go to wtfisqf.com to see a calculator to learn about it in real time and play with it. And I think that's kind of the easiest way to concretely grasp it. But in short, quadratic funding is a funding mechanism that is designed to favor the preferences of the poor and the many over the preferences of the rich and the few. And so what that means is that in the community donating on the platform, if you had, let's say, $100 donated, if you had 100 people donating $1, that is much more heavily weighted in the mechanism than one person donating $100. So it's really trying to allocate funding to the projects that the community at large wants to see built. Um, and so that's kind of the, the intent behind it. So in opposition to a direct grants program where you would have very much, you know, a small group of decision makers, a small committee that's trying to pick a handful of grants to, uh, to fund, this is really kind of bottoms up community based trying to get the projects funded that the most people want to see funded. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. You know, one of the really common criticisms in crypto broadly, like when it comes to governance or any kind of voting uh, voting um, mechanism is, you know, whoever has the most amount of tokens, which often translates to like financial interest, um, are, are super overrepresented or like have the most amount of power. And so quadratic funding as a way to like, it's not the biggest check that holds the most power or has the loudest voice, I think is a really good way to kind of democratize the grants process even, or like even any, like I think, it can go beyond just like financial contributions. I'm hoping to see more of that in like governance and just like way people actually make decisions. 
Totally. And yeah, and it's not to say that there's not value in, you know, direct grants programs or centralized decision making to some extent. But I think, you know, we've seen a lot of our funding partners who perhaps have a direct grants program already using quadratic funding as kind of an add on to be able to make sure they're also capturing the community sentiment and not missing anything that the community sees as really valuable to fund. So I think there's there's power in, in both. And I just think, you know, historically, most of our mechanisms in society have just been centralized because it's easier. You think, you know, you mentioned governance, right? Historically, companies are governed by a small board of directors and there hasn't really been much in the way of bottoms up governance. So I think this is one of many efforts in the crypto space to kind of move us in that direction. So this is maybe more of a moral question, um, but how do you actually determine what counts as a public good in the crypto context? Yeah, that's a great question and one that is a continuous journey for us at Gitcoin. Um, you know, as as you mentioned at the top of the show, sort of the economics definition of a public good is something that is not excludable and non rivalrous. Um, but the question then becomes, how do you implement that type of decisioning at scale, right? It's really hard to go into a specific project and perform that analysis of truly does it, it meet both of those criteria. Um, we at Gitcoin for the past several rounds have used kind of the criteria as a proxy that is the project should not have raised VC funding or should not have a token. Uh, but I think we're realizing in a bunch of the appeals that have come up lately that there are a lot of projects that, you know, launch tokens for a variety of reasons these days that are not just kind of like ICO-esque, I need to, you know, fund my project um, in a really big way. And there, you know, there are, so there are some token-based projects that have been on Gitcoin grants. Um, and I think this brings up kind of the the conversation and the need to define public good um, in a, a little bit more of a sustainable fashion, especially as we scale. We now have thousands of grantees on the platform and we're only getting bigger every round. And so finding a way to scale kind of the, the public goods eligibility without a ton of, you know, human centralized uh, fraud intervention on our end is top of mind. I think ultimately we will move to a more community led definition so that rather than Gitcoin deciding top down, like what the criteria are, letting the community kind of vote on what can, is considered a public good to them. Um, and this is kind of a classic sort of definitional challenge in public goods and kind of from the economic sense from from way back when is even what is a public, right? You know, there's a public that is the Ethereum community, but that's not, you know, the public to everyone. There are publics that, you know, are nation state sort of government, you know, driven. And if you have a certain passport, you're part of that public. But again, that is exclusive to, to others. Um, so that is definitely there's there's a really big question here to figure out. Um, but I think, yeah, to me, ultimately, kind of like a bottoms up definition is is probably where we'll end up landing. Yeah. And I mean, also, given the early days, I imagine the people who end up going to Gitcoin to get funded are a little bit self-selecting. Um, so I'm sure as we scale and as the industry matures, we all collectively figure out a better way to define, you know, all of these terms that we're using today. Um, so I know that the last Gitcoin grant has round just closed. And I, I think I saw an email that said it was like hundreds of projects um, and like 44,000 contributors. That's pretty wild. Um, and so contributors in the sense that like everyone that's donated something, um, is that what it means? Yeah, that's right. So it was 44,000 unique wallet addresses in this past grants round contributed to a grant on Gitcoin. Uh, which was incredible growth to see over the previous round. Um, definitely more more new folks getting engaged with the ecosystem. Um, and we distributed about $5 million in that round to about, I think it's about 1,200 grantees this time. Um, so yeah, definitely reaching a level of scale that, um, you know, hopefully will be more and more impactful over time. And just excited to see the Web3 community rally around these quarterly rounds and and get involved in supporting projects. Yeah. As a, also as a plug, it's really interesting for me to go on every time like there's a new round just to see what people are working on. Um, I think that's like, you know, if you really want to see like who's forefront thinking about working on new interesting projects um, and things that don't necessarily have to be like a VC funded project, it's a good, Gitcoin's a really good resource for that. So just a plug um, to check out the next round. So 
you know, looking into your background, so you used to work in VC, I think you were in banking, um, and you tweet a lot about the like woes of working in a DAO. So that's like, I think, culture shock from everyone coming from Web 2 to Web 3, but in particular, from Web 2 to Web 3 in a DAO. So um, I wanted to ask about some of your big like culture shocks or like things that you were really surprised that were either good or bad. Totally. Yeah, I think for anyone moving from Web 2 to Web 3, there's certainly a culture shock uh, just in terms of, you know, how things operate. And I think for me, like probably even less so relative to the average person because I was working in venture and kind of like at the forefront um, rather than in, you know, a more established job. But I think the DAO structure in particular uh, is probably where I personally have felt most of the culture shock. Um it's just a brand new way of working and operating and organizing and trying to rally teams uh, and people in service of a broader objective. Um, in a DAO, you get all sorts of contributors that are very high context and have been around for a long time and are full time, but you also get people coming in from the internet um, every day who have no context and you know are wanting to start contributing and trying to find ways to include them and engage them meaningfully um, without causing, you know, a burden on kind of, you know, the organization and productivity is definitely something that's top of mind. Um, you know, I think working in a DAO, it's, it's high highs and it's low lows. Like there's days where it's like, wow, we are working on the biggest problems at the forefront and nobody's ever done this before. And like, this is just incredible. And that's how I feel most days. But there's also times where it's like, wow, this at the same time, you know, that lack of structure can cause a lot of, you know, coordination challenges, um, just like lack of clear defined accountability and all of that. And so there's definitely a lot of a lot of struggles to work through as well. Um, but for me, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love kind of having to navigate that new territory. And uh, yeah, I'm just super excited by by what I see both in the Gitcoin DAO and in the DAO space overall. I think when we look at, you know, in 10 or 20 years, what work looks like and kind of like, you know, thinking about the future of work, I think a lot of it is going to be reflective of what you see in DAOs today. I was getting drinks literally just yesterday with someone I went to high school with. And she's, you know, she's not in crypto at all. She's very interested. And we came to the topic of DAOs. And she was basically just like, what are DAOs? You know, in my mind, she said, DAOs are just like what people do when they want PR, when they want to do marketing. And so I was trying to explain to her the concept of like, you know, if you're a user, you get tokens, you can like have a say in the product roadmap. And and she was like, oh, that's really cool. But isn't that just really, really messy? And I was like, yes, 100%. It's super chaotic at all times. Yeah, it definitely is chaotic. Um, but the glimmers you see of like exactly as you say, kind of, you know, um, contributors having a say in those types of decisions that would typically be made at a board level or at an executive level. Um, and now a lot of that being more democratized across all contributors. Um, yeah, just so much more happening in public that would typically happen behind closed doors. So, yeah, the chaos is real. But, um, you know, I think the, the innovation is also very real. For sure. I fully agree. And I think it's messy today, but like everything in the start is is messy. And sure, even with voting, like on proposals, you're like, you know, I feel like we're still getting to like, a, where do you go and vote for things? And like, you know, I feel like we're, we're getting there. Um, what are you really excited about in, in crypto right now? Oh, man, so many things. Um, yeah, as I said, at, at kind of at the top of the show, I'm I'm really excited about crypto generally speaking, from the context of think, rethinking from first principles, how we operate like society, companies and money. Um, I initially came at crypto from a very sort of like macroeconomic investor lens, like being worried about the future of the US dollar and thinking about, you know, the thesis of Bitcoin being digital gold and whether or not I agreed with that. Um, and as I ended up going deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, I realized there's just so much more than just the money angle. And you know, understanding Ethereum as sort of a virtual computer on which all of these applications and even economies um, in and of themselves are being built today. Um, I'm just so excited by, yeah, the potential to redefine like how we do society in the information age from the ground up. Um, so that's kind of my like very, very general long-term um, game and excitement when it comes to crypto. Um, 
in the near term, there's a lot of things I'm excited about. I think a lot of the work happening on kind of the data side and just, you know, data infrastructure and enabling um, applications to be built in a much more powerful, user-friendly and kind of privacy preserving way is, is really exciting to me. Um, a lot around kind of, you know, curation uh, and being able to, you know, share things, you know, in a lot more kind of an, an intentional way. Um, and that happening in Web3 is very exciting. There's so many things I could keep going down the list, but I think, yeah, top line, like just being able to redefine, um, you know, structures around how we govern um, is, is what's really exciting to me. Um, do you see a world? I think about this actually a lot. So I think once you get crypto pilled, you like really never come back from it. And so I think everyone who's in the industry, we're kind of just like, you know what, the world, like everyone will also like, we're hoping to build like an industry in which everyone else can get onboarded easier. Um, and so as I start to talk about the concept of DAOs and, and like um, tokens in the hands of the users, um, this is more of like a yes or no question and we can have a fun thought experiment. Um, do you think it makes sense for like eventually every company to become a DAO? No, not necessarily. Um, I'm very much, and I've said this before, I'm, I'm very much not a DAO maxi. I think DAOs are providing, as I said earlier, insight into a lot of where the future of work is likely to go and like just how we coordinate as humans. And, you know, even like one example, very tactically being like, try before you buy as an employee and as an employer. Like, I think just how we've done hiring in Web2 is just like kind of crazy. And even a lot of the experimentation I'm seeing there in DAOs, I'm like, I don't see a world where co companies don't take on kind of more of this experimentation and, and being a little bit more fluid in terms of employment. Um, but no, I don't think every company needs to or should necessarily be a DAO whatsoever. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, I, I have, I do have questions about kind of the, you know, DAOs in the next 10 years and how, how big of a thing will they be versus traditional companies. And I like, I think the likely typical company ends up kind of in between like a traditional company and a DAO today. I think there's really good things from both worlds. Um, but no, I'm definitely not like a, you know, DAOs will rule the world, um, total DAO maxi by any means. Yeah. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, like DAOs, and the way they're structured and like how it rewards users. A lot of that I think also has to do with like um, where value has accrued in Web2 companies. Um, and I think, you know, the big like criticism of Web2 is like, you know, you build all this value off the backs of your users, especially as like platforms. Um, and the platforms, you know, ended up, and the platforms are owned or controlled by like, you know, five people um, and the people who, in which, you know, make up your community and lets you profit are whatever, you know, you're selling their data. And so like, it's a lot of extracting again and again from these people that really propped you up. And so sometimes where I think about where DAOs make sense or like why people are so into it, once you get it, it's really where the value is and also where the control is. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent agree with that. Um, and yeah, I I thought also for what it's worth with kind of the DAO and company thing, I don't think of it as binary necessarily. Like I think there is very much a spectrum. Um, you know, there are some DAOs that are much more centralized. There are some companies that are much more kind of decentralized and flat structures. And so there's a lot of fluidity there. But yeah, 100% agree on kind of the, you know, the almost business model side of like platform versus protocol and where value accrues to. Um, and there's probably some way you can like layer that onto the, the company matrix and, uh, and have, have different structures. Yeah. yeah. T tying it back to, to public goods. And I think you were saying that earlier, um, but I guess, you know, public goods as it applies to crypto, I think actually takes on a whole new meaning as well. So like, I think a public good, when I think about it in like, I don't know, the traditional sense is like not profitable, I guess. Is that like a right way to think about it? And I don't know that's necessarily has to be true uh actually yeah true for like crypto because like public and crypto is like okay maybe protocols but i feel like there's like basically everything in crypto is open source so technically you can define it as everything is public um i don't know is that too messy no i don't think so and i yeah i, I think that's a really interesting question around like you know can a public good be profitable uh, or not and i i think the answer to me is yes right like you know the definition of not excludable and non rivalrous does not, you know, take into account sort of the creator of that and what their economic incentive is. 
it's more so kind of what they're providing and, and kind of what that means for the end user. Um, and so, no, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a um, constraint by any means. Um, but as, as I try and think through strong examples of public goods that are deeply profitable, I struggle. I'm sure they're out there, <laughs> but there's nothing immediately that that comes to mind. Are there any really interesting projects or grants um, in, in the latest Gitcoin round that I don't know that like you think about um, or what you looked at and you're like, oh, wow, this is really cool and interesting. Oh, so many. I mean, yeah, again, as I said, there were there are like 1200 in the latest rounds. So there's a ton to go through. Um, but I think for me, what's what's been really exciting about this past round and even the one or two rounds before is we as Gitcoin have expanded pretty intentionally beyond just kind of open source and into public goods more broadly. As I mentioned, you know, we were initially very focused on digital public goods and funding of open source because we saw a clear gap there. Um, but in the last couple of rounds, we've actually been expanding into kind of like off-chain public goods. So we've run sub rounds around areas like climate, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, even blockchain advocacy and raising funds for those types of things, um, which brings in a really interesting different grantee set, many of whom like this is their first time in crypto, you know, they're setting up a MetaMask wallet for the first time so they can receive funds from Gitcoin and they've never engaged before. Um, so I think that's really interesting on many levels. Like we actually had one grantee in the last couple of rounds who is um, planting fruit trees in rural Uganda. So like really not open source, really not crypto, um, but has received a ton of support from the community because um, that's something that, you know, in the context of the climate, um, the community has seen as really valuable. So that's where I get really excited. Of course, I'm, you know, eternally excited about kind of this open source problem statement and the work we're doing there. And that's super, super important. Um, but also rethinking, you know, traditional philanthropy and even, you know, like, you know, taxation mechanisms and how governments have funded public goods and thinking about how we might do that in a more bottoms up manner is something we're experimenting with and playing with and have started in the last couple of rounds that that really gets me going. I love those examples so much. I, I'm sure you get this a lot, but you know, people who are, not, I feel like often ask me or like sketch of crypto, that's like, what are the use cases? And like crypto doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the real world and how real people, you know, live and work. And I think um, having examples like that um, is so powerful and it makes a lot of sense. Like um, if someone wants to plant trees, they should do that. And they should, they should do that. And they should be able to like, you know, buy whatever they need to, to like grow trees. <laughs> yeah, totally. No. So public goods come in, in many shapes and sizes and yeah, I'm excited about us expanding beyond just digital. Last question. Where can people go to learn more about Gitcoin and get involved in the next grants process, either to help out, submit a grant or be a contributor? So a few good places, gitcoin.co slash grants. As I mentioned, if you want to just kind of browse through grants, get familiar with what they are and how they work, or even submit an application for a grant yourself. Um, our Twitter, just at Gitcoin, uh, is a great place to start as well. And that has the link to our Discord, which is where you should jump in if you want to join the conversation and start contributing in the DAO. Um, so yeah, that's where I would I would start for anyone interested in getting involved. Gitcoin also has a really awesome like learn tab and like a lot of learning resources um, that I recommend to a lot of my newbie friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about all things public goods and Bitcoin. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Cross Chain Examination. I hope you enjoyed the discussion on public goods. Please make sure to subscribe, rate, comment, um, and let me know what you thought of the episode. We are on Twitter at Cross Chain Pod, or you can follow me at Catherine YK Wu. Looking forward to hearing your feedback. And as always, we'll see you next week.